COVID-19 crisis is one of many indicators that we live in dangerous and uncertain times. There are others, of course, uh, the international community's response to technological and uh, climate change issues, demographic shifts, growing poverty and inequality, as well as global insecurity. Danny Bradlow is Professor of International Development Law and African Economic Relations at the University of Pretoria. He writes that global governance arrangements for managing these changes no longer are fit for purpose. And he joins me on Friday lunchtime. Professor, good afternoon to you. Uh, you write that changes are pushing countries to reassess how they use foreign policy to serve their national interest. In what way? Well, so if you start with um, global governance, the institution, the UN, uh, the G20, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the WTO, the WHO, none of them are really working the way we need them to work and to be responsive to the problems that we have. So that's the first area, and we can come back to talk about that. It's also, um, as you mentioned, there's so many different areas that are affected by foreign policy now or have an international dimension, health, uh, economics, social issues, migration, that countries have to rethink how do they use foreign policy to deal with all those different issues. Also, they need to think about the fact that it's no longer just the state that's involved in international relations. Business, labor, civil society all play a role in international relations now. And so the challenge is how do you integrate all that into a coherent whole and a coherent strategy? Well, let's talk about that integration in just a moment. But you also suggest, Professor, that any new type of foreign policy has to, and I quote, be consistent with the values and governance arrangements that are set out in the Constitution. Are, are you suggesting that maybe we are failing in that respect? I think the, the Constitution is the expression of our values as a society. And so how we want to express that in foreign policy is a very important issue. Um, it's, we can't be naive in thinking that it's only the values that get expressed in foreign policy. It's also our national interests, our practical national interests, economic, security. It's also a question of power. So what can we actually achieve? So all of that has to be balanced. Um, but the standard that we should always be striving to meet are the values expressed in the Constitution. And I, I think civil society, the media, should be holding government accountable, even when we know that maybe there's a good reason why they haven't met that standard, we should still hold them accountable to that. Let's come back to that word that you used, integration, in the South African genre. One of the suggestions that you make is the presidency should establish an interagency coordinating council. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, what would that council do? Right. It is a mouthful. But the goal of that council would be to say so many different parts of government are now involved in foreign policy. And it's important that all of them are working together towards some coherent strategy for the country. And the only place in the government that, where that kind of interagency coordination can take place is in the presidency. And it needs a council that brings all those different groups together to work out what the goal for the country is, how each of them are going to contribute to that, can uh, interact with other actors, with, um, with civil society, with business, with labor, with academia, um, to make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck, in a sense, mm -hmm. out of our foreign policy. Is that giving more heft, more muscle to the Department of International Relations and Cooperation? Or if government moves in this direction, is that taking powers away from it? I don't think it takes powers away from it, because the job of DERCO should be to be the implementer of that policy. So, But where the policy gets made, it has to be on an interagency basis, because DERCO alone doesn't know what needs to be done in health, for example. It can have some idea of what needs to be done in environment, but it doesn't necessarily know what water affairs needs or agriculture needs. Um, so you need some mechanism where it's getting the guidance that it needs from all these different actors and then can go into international forums and work to, implement, to achieve what's needed for those different departments. In theory, that sounds right, but the departments that you're suggesting, do they not have their hands full with domestic priorities? But it's true they, they have big domestic agendas, but part of those domestic agendas really have international dimensions. So the health department, for example, cannot deal with the COVID pandemic without thinking about 
how does migration influence that? How does it interact with the WHO, with um, with Gavi, with the different institutions, with the Bill Gates Foundation? Um, it, so that's for example one example. Environment obviously has to be dealing with climate as well as domestic issues. Uh, housing even has to think about well, what is the impact of migration on housing policy? So it has to think about the international dimensions as well. It's not the major job, but it's an important part of their job. Just a final question to you, Professor Bradler, and this really is fascinating and important. We also, I would imagine, have a fair amount of global clawbacking to do, and I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, the lost years during the Zuma administration, the crisis of state capture, you say that we now as a country have to position ourselves in pursuing creative and principled solutions to uh, global issues. We used to be respected on that front. I would contend that that respect perhaps has, uh, has diminished slightly. There's no question that we paid a big price during the Zuma years. But if you look, for example, in the IMF, um, the governor of the Reserve Bank is highly respected and chairs the, the leading committee, the International Monetary and Finance Committee. In climate change, our voice is listened to. In the WTO, the South Africa is leading the effort now to waive the intellectual property rules to make sure the vaccines that are coming in on the market soon uh, will be fairly distributed around the world. So those are examples where even though we have lost something, we still do have uh, a lot of credibility in areas where we've shown that we're serious, we're principled, we're, we're working hard, and our voice is listened mm -hmm. to. I'm going to leave it there, and thank you very much for joining us, Sir Danny Bradler, Professor of International Development Law and Economic Relations at the University of Pretoria. Now